All right, so I'm going to say good evening to everybody, and I know that you're all on that stage of Limud where there's so much information. And what I want to try and do right now is to take you, I've been sitting in on a few of the different sessions. I myself only arrived today. You've all read my bio. You all know my background. You all know where I'm coming from, right? Not, okay? But, so I'm going to give a little bit of my own background, and I'm going to dive into the subject. And when I dive into the subject of Israel's changing society, part of what I want to do is I want to take our own stereotypes. And when I say our own stereotypes, I'm going to start even from myself and try and talk about the changes that Israel is going through, because when we look into the future, when we talk about the Jewish world, when we talk about the Israeli world, we need to be aware that Israel is going through enormous society changes. And I want to take you through them. I sat in a few of the different sessions today and I heard lots of people throwing out numbers about the amount of people in Israel and about what Israeli society is like. I came prepared and that's one of the reasons I don't usually speak also with um, numbers, but I needed to come with numbers. I can't stand here and start talking about Israeli society and not give you a few of the numbers. And numbers, and when we talk about statistics, I adore statistics, I use them extensively, which means you can show statistics any way you want. I went and took only the statistics of the Israeli Central Bureau of Statistics, from now I'll be calling it CBS. I've worked extensively with the media in the past, a very different CBS. Um, the Central Bureau of Statistics, the Israeli Central Bureau of Statistics, gives on almost um, a weekly basis, a monthly basis, and on every holiday, for every reason, they give out lots of data about Israeli society. I'll be using that so that we'll be on common ground, because I don't want us to start arguing about if there's a million more or less, and again, I'm only going to be using the Israeli Central Bureau of Statistics, um, statistics and not anybody else's. My own background. So I've been hearing a lot of different people throughout the day, and really we all have such diverse backgrounds. As you can hear, I have an American accent. My parents made Aliyah 42 years ago. I'm through and through Israeli. I'm very much American. I'm the combination of the both. But since Aliyah 42 years ago is a pretty long time ago, um, I served for most of my adult life in the Israeli military. I'm a retired colonel. I served in the Israeli um, intelligence community. And then towards the end of my serving in the intelligence community, I transitioned quite drastically into the spokesmanship media world. And when I did so, it kind of changed my background in the intelligence community. But since then, I also became the Israeli Prime Minister's international media advisor. I did that under Prime Minister Olmert um, in 2006, 2007. And so when you say, ah, you recognize the face, or sometimes people actually say that they recognize my voice, it's because you've got to hear it way too much, usually during, during very bad events. Because when I was on TV, that usually meant that something bad was going on. It could have been the second Lebanon war when I was the main spokesperson um, and in the years after that. So it's just a little bit of the background, and I'm stepping into this issue of Israeli changing society. Um, I teach at IDC, the Israeli, um, the International, is it the International? International Disciplinary um, College in Herzliya. I do a lot of different um, hosting of all sorts of different groups that come into Israel. And when we start and we sit down, and I'm immediately saying that, just to get an idea to myself, how many people here have been to Israel? Switch side, how many people have not been to Israel? Okay, that's one of those different aspects, okay? So we all know everything about Israel. <laughs> we've been there, we've seen it, and we have our own ideas of what it is. And when we talk about statistics in general, and when we talk especially about the statistics of the state of Israel, and I'm not turning the lights down, I think that you can see clear enough, and it's just statistics, I can always do that afterwards if you need, but I wanna just talk first of all about numbers. And when we talk about numbers, the Israeli Central Bureau of Statistics, and that's the way that they write it, it's not the way that Miri chose to write it, is that they define Israelis in three categories. Jews, Arabs, and others. It's not my definition, it's the way that they define it. It's a difficult definition, because Jews, is it halachic Jews or not halachic Jews? Arabs, is it the Muslim Arabs? Is it the ones who speak Arabic as a native language? Think just to yourself, and I'm gonna talk in a moment about society, that just within that own definition, you're already getting into something challenging, and we're the only country in the world where you have Jews, I mean the non-Arab creatures that are there, but Jews and others, and then you have Arabs, and the statistics itself are always a very challenging kind of number, because it gives on the top how many Jews and others are of all of society. And it's interesting because Jews, if you cut it down a different way, is in Israel right now, there are eight million people. I'm gonna give the rounded out number. 
And of the 8 million Israeli citizens, and I'm only talking right now about the Israeli Society of Israeli Citizens, I'm not talking right now, not about the West Bank and Gaza Palestinians at all. I am including within the 8 million citizens all of the settlers in the West Bank because they are Israeli citizens. And that's on the number within the Jews themselves. And there are 8 million citizens in the state of Israel as we talk today. And I want to take you a little bit on a journey first when it comes to statistics and numbers. So it's 2013. In another week, it's going to be 2014. Israel has right now 8 million citizens. When my parents made Aliyah in 1971, and that was 42 years ago, in Israel there were 3.2 million citizens. 3.2 million in 1971. Two, 8 million in 2013, almost 14. That's not natural growth. Israel is a immigration society, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. We have double whammy to a large degree. We're the only Western country that has a very high birth rate. I'll talk about that in a moment. And together with that, we're an immigration society. And that means that our numbers, when you look at it and you start from 1948, and you take that step in 1971, which I just chose randomly, and you go on to 2013, and the, almost on the eve of 2014, you're going from 650,000 Jews 1948, to, and that's citizens 1948, to, in 1971, 3.2 million, and then going on and up towards the 8 million that we have today, okay. That's growth, that's one aspect of looking at it. And the other aspect is in the way that it's broken down. The Israeli Central Bureau of Statistics ask you a question. Remember, we're a democracy. How do you define yourself? And I wanna take us on a journey on this issue, both of our self-definition as a society, the implications of what it means in both education, in the workforce, and what Israel is going to look like in another 10, 20, 30 years because the changes that are happening within our own society and demography are quite enormous. I'll even say that they are revolutionary. That doesn't mean that there's a revolution that's gonna happen overnight, but we are in the middle of an enormous demographic change. So I'm starting from the first numbers. Eight million people, 75% define themselves as Jewish. I'm not talking about halachic Jews. 75% are Jewish. 21% are defined as Muslim. Okay, and 4% are other. So we're the only country in the world where you have that definition of Jews, Muslims, and other. There are lots of West European countries right now that when you go into their statistics and they don't ask it in the same way, and you ask both about religion and also about the way that people relate to themselves, that you are going to find countries that have 10 to 15% minorities that are Muslim minorities in Western European countries today. Um, Sweden is heading up into the 20 percentage of a Muslim minority inside Sweden. Um, Norway's a little bit behind that. Belgium doesn't have an official number. France is also with these difficulties. But when I talk about that general number of having 75% Jewish, 21% Muslim, and 4% other, other countries have similar type of statistics within their different types of societies. But when we dig into Israel and we talk about what we think of when we think about Israel itself, most of us, when we think about Israel and in the Israeli terms of what Israel used to be, we, we go back kind of to the social pioneers of the 1920s and the 1930s. To a large degree, when we think of Israel, we think of Israel as being established and based upon the social pioneers that were once upon a time into a certain, I mean, it's just that throwback of that kind of picture of going on and out. Um, in the session that I was sitting in here before, where it was a very interesting one about North American Jewry and the influence, really, of Jews inside the United States of America right now in all sorts of different senses, um, one of the speakers there spoke about um, Tevya. He spoke about Fiddler on the Roof, and he spoke about Fiddler on the Roof, and I was thinking to myself, it's interesting. When we think of the social pioneers in Israel, or more correctly in Palestine, in the 1910s and 20s, in the 20s and 30s, in the 30s, and even in the 40s, in the midst of World War II, or in the aftermath of World War II, we always talk about the eventing of the new Jew, that they weren't like Tevya, that they were something else, that they were showing their bodies in a very different way, that they were showing themselves in a very different way. To a large degree, when we think about Israel, we have a tendency to think about Israel in these terms. 
in Israeli society is not about that anymore. The strength in some portions of Israeli society right now is much more within venture startups than in social pioneers. And I put that up on the board as just two contradictory messages to open up the idea of the journey of Israeli society and where Israeli society is right now and where we're going. So I started by saying that in 1948, when the State of Israel was established, in 1948, the amount of Jews that was inside Israel at the time was 650,000. Now, to me, it's kind of fascinating. You don't always get the chance, certainly not in the modern world, to invent a state. And in 1947 and in 1948, when the state of Israel was established, was declared, it was actually based on seminars, which I kind of like to think of them as a limud that was done at the time with the Jews that were mainly inside Palestine, because it was mainly done at that time, still under the British mandate. Now think about it. Think of all of us sitting here. Think about what we're learning and what we're doing. And in 1947, 1948, they decide that they're going to put together a state that's going to have what kind of education system? How do you define one? If you're not evolving into something, how do you define it? What kind of economy are they going to have? What kind of social welfare system are they going to have? They had, to a large degree, the prerogative, the opportunity to invent whatever they wanted. And when they invented it in 1948, on one single day, in November of 1948, still in the War of Independence, still when the war was going on, the State of Israel, which had just been declared on May 14th, 1948, in November 1948, they took a day off. And when I say that they took a day off, they said to everybody in 1948, on this day, you have to stay at home. And on one day in 1948, where they actually did a curfew so that everybody would stay at home, they counted all of the people, not the Jews, not the Arabs, not the Muslims, they counted all of the people who were within the lines that Israel sat on on that day in mid-November 1948. And based on that census that they did, in November 1948, they had the first elections in the state of Israel in January 1949, because how else do you do elections? How do you count the people? Who gets to be a citizen? And what they did is they took a day off of the war. I mean, it was at the stage where the war was slightly in a lull in mid-November. They counted the citizens, and the um, graph of the citizens of the state of Israel in 1948, as opposed to today, and I'm putting up all the numbers right now, okay, just to give you an idea, because the 1949 numbers are the, nine, are the numbers that are based on the statistics that they gathered on that day in November 1948, and then the first elections that took place in January of 1949. Can you see it? Should I turn it down? Do you need a bit? Okay, yes, I was told that I could do this, so this is where I, I try. Is that better? I don't know how to do it any less. Okay? Excellent. So when we look at these, we again get the different type of statistics that show us the differences in the numbers of society. And this is just one aspect which is showing us the different ethnic groups, religious groups, cultural groups. Think about it for a minute. In the definitions that are here right now, it's showing it clear cut as religion. But is Jewish religion? And here I want to continue on that journey of Israeli society right now because the numbers themselves that are the distinct numbers of Israeli society throughout our history are the numbers that differentiate between Jews, Muslims, and others. And that's one distinct aspect that has to do with Israeli governance of the whole aspect of the way that Israel has been built between Israel as a Jewish democratic state, the balance between the Jewish and the democracy, and the way that you're seeing it within these numbers here from the beginning all of the citizens, the 100%, are all full citizens of the state of Israel. That doesn't mean that they haven't had discrimination in all sorts of different ways. But the numbers themselves over the years, steady, raising, lowering. It's one that you can see distinctly. When we step down into it, what I want to step into is in the numbers of the Jews. And here I am going to talk about the different subdivisions. So I adore the Central Bureau of Statistics because the Central Bureau of Statistics, who sometimes actually call me in my house also, they call you up. And I want you now to think about this because I don't know if there's the equivalent of this in the UK. You do statistics gathering worldwide in all sorts of different ways, but there are different laws in different countries of what you're allowed to ask or not. So you get the phone call and it says to you, hello, okay, are you willing to participate in the poll? And once you say that you're willing to participate in the poll, they ask you, what are you? And you answer, I'm a Jew. 
or you answer I'm an Arab, or you, okay, just think of that first initial one. And then there's the follow-up question and the list that the Central Bureau of Statistics of Israel then ask you. And they ask you, they don't tell you. And I want you to think right now of your own self-definition. How would you define yourself? They're gonna ask you as a Jew. Would you call yourself ultra-Orthodox? In Israeli terms, we call that Haredim. Would you call yourself modern religious? Is the term that they say in Israel, it's the, the um, Dati, I mean, it's just a, it's a, uh, it's, it's not that they ask if you're orthodox, they ask if you would consider yourself religious, Dati, as opposed to ultra-orthodox, Haredi. The next one in Hebrew is called Masorati. Would you call yourself traditional? After that, you get to non-religious traditionalist. That's a subdivision that when they ask you, they only do that subdivision afterwards. The um, religious traditionalists and the non-religious traditionalists are part of the same group in the Central Bureau of Statistics. And the last one is the secular. And you get numbers. And you look at the state of Israel. And here what they're taking is the 75% of Israelis, citizens, who are Jewish, they're asking them, what kind of a Jew are you? And you look at these numbers and you go, huh, 8% Haredim of the Jews, religious, traditional, non-religious traditional, and look at that enormous number of the secular Jews, okay? So let's start from the easier things. All of these Jews, when asked, all of them, overwhelmingly say that they do a Passover Seder, okay? The difference between the religious and the secular has to do with Kashrut, Shabbat, those are the two main distinctions. And when you look at what all of them put all in together, the different groups within have very differing ideas of who's Jewish and who's not Jewish. And I'm completely accepting the whole aspect of the Haredim and the religious who live their life according to a religious um, lifestyle, which is very different from the other groups that you see here. I'm going to get to that. No, but that, that's we're going to get to education. Right now, all I'm talking about is their own self-identification. Now, just for those, and it doesn't matter if you've been to Israel or haven't been to Israel, but to remind ourselves of somebody who would define themselves, I would certainly not call myself secular, but I'm not a religious Jew, and I can't consider myself religious traditionalist, okay? So I would probably put myself in the non-religious traditionalist. What in the world does that mean? It means that my kids certainly go to synagogue every once in a while, I suppose, right? Okay? Um, I know what kosher is. I don't keep it. I don't keep Shabbat, but I light Shabbat candles, and we say Shabbat brachot every Friday night. Why? Kacha. You, each person defining to themselves what I like the most is um, Israelis who, um, during the week of Passover, will go eat in an absolutely non-kosher restaurant, but they won't eat, they'll eat non-kosher food, but they won't eat the pita or the bread, they'll only eat matzah. Because you do this, you don't do that. It's something which is difficult to define even within itself. And again, it isn't something that's defined. It's something that's a, it's a self-identification on how you would do this, because these Central Bureau of Statistic numbers are ones that are showing their own definition of how they see themselves. But in Israel, the translation of both the other statistics which show all of the state of Israel, together with the ones that are only showing right now the Jews in the state of Israel, have translated themselves, and this has an enormous impact on Israeli society, into four distinct different education systems that are all funded by the state of Israel, funded by the government of Israel, and they each have a different representation that I'm going to explore here. I saw a thing, was it something that you wanted to ask me now? Everybody does the Passover Seder. Um, whenever they've asked in polls in Israel, 98% of Israelis, that's one of those kind of numbers which are impossible, of the Jews, say that they do a Passover Seder or participate in a Passover Seder. And when they ask the 2% who don't do, why they don't do, it's not because they're against it. Okay? It's...
it's, it's an excellent question that the Central Bureau of Statistics doesn't give you an answer. They ask you how you define yourself, okay? And it's a very personal aspect, because what is a secular Jew in Israel, okay? So I'm gonna try and answer it now through the education system to give you, again, part of the answer, because that's part of the aspect of talking about a society and saying that Israel is the Jewish state that 75% of Israeli citizens are Jewish. When you take that 75% that are Jewish, this is the way they define themselves in their Jewish identity. And I agree, it, isn't, it doesn't say here what it means. It's a self-identification, yes. I'm going to talk about that in a moment, don't worry. Okay, we're going to show changing numbers as we go along, and I'll start it again through the education system. In Israel, I'll go a bit more, and then you'll be able to stop me again, okay? Let me... In the of the non-religious traditions, is that people say, like yourself, uh, I, I know what the tradition is, but I choose not to observe it, uh, except occasionally. So I wouldn't call myself religious, but I know the tradition, and I keep Pesach. Maybe, maybe I don't. I like that explanation. Um, I like the explanation. There is not an explanation that comes with the question that you're asked by the Central Bureau of Statistics. And I'm saying that on purpose because at the end, we each give it, when I answer, I think that a lot of people that I know would consider themselves secular. Um, I'm always surprised, by the way, by the amount of people in Israel, by the amount of Jews in Israel who define themselves as secular. And it does have to do, and we're going to get into the education system in a minute, because it does have an impact from there. When the State of Israel was established in 1948, I'll remind you, we transitioned from where we are right now, the British Mandate, into the modern State of Israel. And under the British Mandate, the Jews ran their own school systems. But they had a different school system. Remember, they sat, they did a seminar, they talked about what kind of a state they were going to establish, and they decided a year into the state of Israel, not immediately, they didn't change everything immediately, they decided that they would transition from what had been quite politically um, um, tnua, a little movement-based movement education systems to transition into four government-funded systems. And those exist more or less to this day, all funded by the State of Israel. Right now we have free education, we'll talk afterwards about free if we have time, from age three through age 18. And in that education system, more or less when your kid is around two, it used to be when they were three, but then they lowered the age, you get a letter in the mail. And the letter in the mail tells you what your child has been assigned to, and it's usually based on where you live, but you can choose any of the four. All four options are there. What are the four options? And again, I'm leaving this up on the wall to remind us of where this is coming from. The first option is the option of what you would call government-funded school in Hebrew. In Israel, by the way, it's called national. There isn't. It's called government, but I would call it government national. Okay, and that's the one system, which is system number one. System number two is called government national religious. It is modern religious. They study everything you study in the regular government school. And in addition, in longer hours, and it's a longer school day, they also study religious studies. It's separate boys and girls, not separate schools, separate classrooms. And that in Israel are the two systems which are called like the governmental and the religious governmental. The third system, which corresponds to what I showed you before, is a system which is called the Arab-speaking Israeli system. It's the Arab governmental system in Israel. It's all within the same Bureau of Education. They study the same curriculum, only they study it in Arabic. They study, in addition, Hebrew. They study, in addition, what everybody studies in English, the core studies of science, math, English. And it's all studied in That's three systems governmental, and now again, I'm looking at these numbers and going, okay, where are you sending your kids? Governmental, governmental religious, governmental Arab speaking, which is for the Arab speaking sector in Israel, and the fourth sector, which is funded by the government of Israel and has been funded for many years, it wasn't from the beginning, but it's been funded for many years, is what we call the Haredi, ultra-Orthodox. It's not one system, okay? 
But in that system, it's also funded by the government. It's a system where boys and girls not only study separately, it's separate schools. And from sixth grade and on, in the boys system, they don't study core studies. When I say they don't study core studies, in the boys system, not in the girls Haredi system, in the boys Haredi system, from sixth grade and on until this year, they didn't study math, sciences, or English. Which means that at the end of 12 years in school, I mean, or at the age of 18 or so, you can be incredibly learned. Okay? It's not that you don't know how to learn, but you're totally unemployable and you can't get into any university because you don't know English, you don't know math, and you don't have sciences. Challenges of the State of Israel that I'll be talking about a bit more, but those four education systems mirror to a large degree a lot of the changes that are happening now in Israeli society. Um, we spoke, and some of the other sessions also have been talking a bit about new immigrants and their impact inside Israel. Just to give you also an idea of where people come from, and again, I know with the numbers it doesn't always show of different places where it's coming. Um, the new immigrants that come to Israel are an integral part of the numbers that change our society. From 1990 until 1999, a million new immigrants came to the state of Israel. In Israel right now, because of these different numbers, and I'm not going to show you the one from before, but because of these different numbers of a million immigrants that came in from 1990 until 1999, Russian for one in seven Israelis is the native tongue. We don't think of it in those terms. But if there are eight million Israelis, okay, million immigrants that came in over those years, Right now, one in seven, and because you have second generation, one in seven Israelis' native tongue is Russian. In a moment, I'm going to address the issue of the military and how that also impacts in, together with the education system. But to take that step further in Israeli society and in that impact, in the IDF and the Israeli Defense Forces right now, one in four Israeli soldiers' native tongue is Russian. Okay, so when we're talking about society, we're talking about changes that for most people, if I take you back to that picture of social pioneers coming in from Eastern Europe, building a social welfare labor because social Zionism had a very strong impact on the establishment of the state of Israel, the numbers in society of the state of Israel in 2013 are dramatically different. And the impact on what it's going to look in the future um, is even more obvious, if I can put it in that. Just to have us on and in, in these numbers are 2006. I couldn't, I mean, I know that there are numbers from 2012 now, but they're not distinctly different from where we are. But what you're seeing right now distinctly is that in the world today, more or less, the United States of America with very challenging numbers from the last year, together with Israel, and Israel has surpassed the United States, are the two large Jewish communities in the world, and the rest of the world has little other portions. But when you look at the impact within Israel of Israeli society and of its being the largest Jewish community in the world, and go back to those numbers before, I have to take it back. I forgot to say one thing that I had intended to say before. I'm going to go back to this one, okay? When they show here Haredim, religious, religious traditionalists, and non-religious traditionalists, all of those categories are categories of people who to some degree relate themselves into um, some aspect of Jewish religious life. And even when you look at the secular, okay, these are all of the numbers of the Jews inside Israel. The synagogue that the secular, the religious traditionalists, and the religious non-traditionalists don't go to, because they don't go to synagogue, the synagogue they don't go to is the Orthodox one. Okay? The pluralism or the adaption of what's been very prevalent in North American Jewry, where a good 80% of American Jews are either in the conservative or in the reform movement, in Israel, the synagogue that all of these Jews don't go to is the Orthodox one. And they view the conservative and reform synagogues in general as being a lot worse than not going to synagogue at all. And that's also part of the challenges and differences that just reminded me because of the Jews overseas. Yes? It's an excellent question about the Druze. Um, the Druze are in the Arab speaking system 
One Druze town up north in Israel, I mean, they're all up north in that sense, chose to change its curriculum to the Hebrew-speaking curriculum. And last year, they were the best school in the country in the Hebrew-speaking curriculum. Um, the Druze would define themselves as an ethnic community that speak Arabic. In Israel, part of the issue with the definitions is they don't like being defined as Arabs. They're Druze. They speak Arabic, but they're Druze. And it comes also into the education system. And so they did that in the one town. Um, Druze in Israel are around, in and around 100,000, 125,000. And the question there is, that can you do that overall? They did it in one town. We'll see if they'll move into other ones. No, they did it in Beit Jan. They did it in Beit Jan. And in a moment again, I'll talk about the IDF and the draft, because we go from the education system into the draft and into the segments of society, the workforce and the poor. And we're going to start seeing all sorts of correlations that I want you to be aware of. I'm not standing here now. I'm certainly, I may have been, you know, my mother may have called me Miriam when I was born, but I am not a prophetess. I do not know what will happen. But I want to show you some projections of the implications of the combination of the numbers, the education system, and in a moment, I'm going to talk about the workforce and the social system because, sadly, there are going to be very sad correlations that I'm going to be addressing in a moment. Okay? Good. Quarter to ten. Okay, we're doing okay. Questions? Good. Okay. I know it's a lot of statistics, but otherwise, I can't really explain the numbers that I'm going to show. Okay. Bed John. Bed John. Bed John was number one in Bagrut after they changed to the Hebrew speaking system. And it's one of the questions nowadays, because it's, it's a, I'll talk about that one separately, but yes, it was Bedja. Um, so here we are in Israel and in the workforce, and I'm looking at this one here for the moment, because again, I'm s splitting up Israeli society um, in, in a way which I have to, um, because otherwise we can't understand the challenges that are happening right now in Israel. So the numbers that we have right here are numbers that are from 2011, so they're relatively very up-to-date numbers. And you see that when we look at men and women in the workforce, and this is going to be after the education system, after military, if you did do military, because there are two groups here who don't do military at all, you get into the workforce and you see the differences in the workforce in Israel. And in Israel right now, the reason I'm putting this up it's because together with that definition of Jewish, Muslim, or other, we have here the Haredi, Arab, and secular Jewish, secular or the working Jewish in that sense. When we look at these numbers here, the numbers are going to show that over the last 20 years, overwhelmingly in the state of Israel, we moved from, on purpose, as a decision that was made by the government, from what had been a social welfare governing um, ethics and um, economy to a liberal capitalist, not the same as in the United States of America. We still have overall social health care. We still have a different type of um, net that the government gives. But in Israel, the poor in Israeli society overwhelmingly, look at the numbers, are the Haredi and Arab. So I said that we have four education systems where there's a separate one for Haredi and Arab. And again, separate, all government, all done in a sense looking at overall society to give, because it's always that kind of question, how do you accommodate yes or no, those type of things. From that education system, you arrive at the age of 18. And at the age of 18 in the state of Israel, two groups are exempt from military service. Arab citizens of Israel, with exceptions, overwhelmingly, the 21% Muslims are not drafted. 21% of the Israeli society, the 18-year-olds, are not drafted. There are exceptions within that are. The Druze community men are drafted. And the Haredi are not drafted. And when you look at these numbers here, this is percentage-wise within each one of those communities who's working. And I want you to take note that Haredi women work a lot more than Haredi men. Haredi women and the number of children in the Haredi households in Israel have brought about the following situation. In 1948, 
the Haredes were less than half a percent in the state of Israel. And what happened, I'm really bad, it's funny because I use statistics so much and I never remember if this is mathematical or geometrical, but they went from half a percent to a percent, and from 1% to 2%, and from 2% to 4%, and from 4% to 8%. And right now, ladies and gentlemen, we are in the middle of a process where within 20 years, they will go from 8% to 16. Okay? And they're already there in the, we're going to get to the education system in a moment. But when I talk about those numbers, those are numbers that are coming out of mainly births and some immigration. When you look within that, these numbers here, as overwhelmingly over 50% of the men don't work, and they have families that have many children, they are overwhelmingly the poor in the state of Israel. And we have a tendency when we look at Israel very clearly to talk about the Arab community as being the poor in Israel. And sadly, they are the poor, but they share that dubious spot together with the Haredi community. The two poor communities in Israel are the Haredi and the Arab communities. They are poor both because they have large numbers of children, but they're poor because of the graph that you're seeing here. Because Haredi men don't work and Arab women don't work. And in the rest of the state of Israel, usually when you're talking about partnerships, et cetera, and you're talking about children, you're talking about two working adults with children. And in those communities, you're only talking about one, and you're talking about a lot of children. What does that mean for the future? So to really make you all go to sleep in this day of Limud totally unhappy, I have to add in some more data, because when it comes to numbers, Okay, um, primary school is um, what I call elementary school. Is, what, what, what would you call it here? It is primary, that's why it's a number that was written that's called here, okay? And right now, I mean, you see that the today here was done in 2010, but the numbers have only, the statistics have not changed, meaning these graphs that have been showing here as a projection or graphs that we're seeing right now with the numbers as they are right now, the right now, in the four systems that I talked about, the ultra-Orthodox and Arab, in the state, and it doesn't matter if the state is what I call the secular or the state is the religious, but the two sections, which are the ones that have the main bread owners, startupists, um, people who go into the military, again, you see the correlation between all of these numbers. You see that in, I'll put it in other words, um, in September and August 2013, the school year started. And the Central Bureau of Statistics put out their statistics. And on September 1st, 2013, that's all of three months ago, in the Arab system are 22% of the first graders. Okay, that's similar to what you saw before. Haredi? Nobody was reading my statistics with me? 24% of the first graders are in the Haredi system. That's in 2013. Now, if you take the two numbers together, a little under 50% of first graders in the state of Israel are either in the Haredi or in the Arab speaking. Okay? It's going down, but it's going down very gradually. The 22% is the peak, and it's projected to go down. But again, within those numbers and the challenges of what we have within Israeli society, um, in Israel, most of the ultra-Orthodox Haredi society are in their own way what I would call self-segregated, meaning they live a lot of times in both communities and cities that are their own communities and cities. Um, there's a city which is next to, it's south of the city of Jerusalem. It's in the West Bank. It's called Beitar Elite. Most people actually have never heard of it. And if you don't go there, you don't actually see it. And then every once in a while I come out to um, communities, especially from the States, but possibly also here from England, where you have relatives in Beitar Elite, so you've actually been there. But most Israelis from that secular or whatever that I was showing before have never been there. Beitar Elite is the largest city, Jewish city, in the West Bank as a, um, as a settlement. And in Beitar Elite, you're all sitting down, so this one's easy. The average family, average, ladies and gentlemen, so, well, it's eight because it has six children, okay? The average family has six children. 
Beitar Elit, a Haredi city in the West Bank. And these kind of numbers are the kind of numbers which, so I'm asking you as a rhetorical question, okay? Do you think this has an impact on Israel in the future? I want to add in now just a few more data and then I'll take a few questions. Okay, let me just add a few more. In Israel, in the governmental system, which includes both what I would call the secular and the religious systems, but the governmental one, the ones where they study the core studies, and in the religious system, as I said, they also study in addition religious studies, not the Haredi, pretty much from 10th grade. The high schoolers, men and women, boys and girls, are not focused all of the time, but they're very aware of the fact that when they finish high school, they are going to be drafted. And in the numbers themselves, where you look at these kind of numbers, within a given high school graduation class, there will be a few who won't be drafted. But overwhelmingly, still in Israel, at the age of 18, young men, young women, and the numbers right now are that in the men, 70, 70 percent of the 18-year-olds are drafted into the IDF. Who's the 30 percent who aren't drafted? Haredi and Arab. We said that, that they're on the 8 percent going up and the 21, okay, that, that's a very clear number. In the women today, because of a difference that they have there on the way that women are drafted, 55, 0 percent of the women are drafted, 50 percent of the women are not drafted, because in addition to the Haredi and Arab women who are not drafted, um, the religious women are also not compulsory drafted. They can get out of it, and at the end of the day, it's 50-50. Now, what that means is that in the state of Israel, we have four education systems, two education systems go into the military, two do not. When you finish the military service, and you saw from the workforce that I was showing before, there's a continuation of the correlation where you're suddenly getting that the poor in Israeli society the ones who have separate education systems, the ones who, have, who are not drafted, it's all similar. And I'm putting them here as challenges. I have no idea how it's going to look in another 10 or 15 years. One of the aspects of statistics where statistics are very problematic and you need to be aware that I call it the statistics can lie, is the fact that today there are 24% of the first graders in Haredi Schools in first grade doesn't mean that it's going to be 24% in sixth grade. And it doesn't mean that they're going to be 24% in 12th grade. It doesn't immediately project that 12 years from now, 24% of the 18-year-olds finish Haredi schools. It isn't a direct correlation on that number, but there's no question whatsoever that enormous changes are going through Israeli society. So I gave you a lot of numbers at a very heavy time at night, but there were all sorts of questions that I wanted to be able to answer. So I'll start up from the back and then I'll come into the middle. Please. Thank you. Um, just going back to your previous uh, slideshow, I was understanding uh, Ronnie O.E. Uh, Ronnie O.E. Okay. The OECD is the organization that Israel, it's one of those clubs that you have to be asked to be, you have to be invited in. You can't um, put yourself in. It's the organization of um, economically developed countries. Israel was invited to join in 2006. We joined officially in 2008, and it is the 35 most developed economies in the world. Is it not the UN? Or? No, it's completely separate. It has nothing to do with the UN. It's based in Europe, but it is made up out of European North, I mean, it's worldwide. Um, having said that, there are no OECD, OECD members from Africa, not even South Africa. Um, OECD, OECD members are the developed economies of the world. So it's the kind of place that you want to be part of, and we were invited in as an economy. And the OECD, and probably statistic-wise, I should add in that together with the Central Bureau of Statistics, the second statistic source, which is a fascinating way to look at Israel, is the way that the OECD look at us, because they compare us to the developed countries. And in some of them, we're way up at the top. I'll show you some other OECDs, uh, mainly in education. Let me, okay. Um, this is higher education in Israel. Um, these, are the OEC, these are all OECD member countries. And in these, the developed countries, this isn't the wor worldwide, there are 190 
for countries and territories that are usually within statistics. In the OECD, it's only 35. It's all top economies. And in this one, it's showing us higher education. So we're number two after Canada. This is in the world, in higher education. When you break it down, we're number one in the world percentage-wise of PhDs. We're equal with Canada on master degrees, percentage-wise. And Canada has a lot more bachelor degrees, which is why they got first place. Okay? But these are numbers which are very, they're, they're comparative to try to put you and see where you are. And you can see where we are compared to the UK. We have a lot more percentage-wise of people who have higher degrees. 46% of Israelis have a, it, it puts into that 46%, it puts both the BA, the MA, and the PhD. It's taking all of them into account. Despite the fact that Haredi are not in there. So things are happening in the Haredi world also. Because one of the aspects that happened of that sad correlation between poor education, where you can go, is that over a decade ago, the government started a program where they said, it's not that the Haredi, I'm, I'm, I'm being not PC right now and I apologize, they're not ignorant. They're not uneducated, okay? They, they're very educated. They just don't know core studies. And they did a program over 15 years ago where they took a classroom of Haredi men who were willing to do so, and they finished high school curriculum in one year. And then they got into college. And what, you know, in Israel, one of the aspects of the higher education, we haven't built a lot of new universities lately, but we have built dozens of colleges. Israel has right now over 70 colleges. For most people who come, you know, like, they always knew we had seven universities and then eight universities, and then we had like one, the first college was only open 20 years ago, and we now have over 70 colleges. Colleges are very prevalent for undergraduate degrees and for some graduate degrees, not PhDs. And I put that here because the Haredi community are starting to go to college. It's in small numbers, but that's a change. They do one year to close the high school gap, and they study, they're studying computer sciences, they're stu they're, they're, but it's, again, it's a small number. It's changes that could still happen. Please. And then there was somebody here who had wanted to ask, and I felt bad, but that was like, you were here in the middle, so I remember you. Please. Uh, two questions. Firstly, I mean, I'll, I'll, so I'll, do it, I'll just do it one at a time so that I can try and give a more full answer. Repeat the question. And I will repeat the question. If you look at the Israeli population, you can see that in general, the amount of, and again, I'm saying here there's Muslims, there's Arabs, the, the Druze community, which is an ethnic group, which are not Muslim, but they speak Arabic, and you have Druze in Israel, in Lebanon, and in Syria, and in Syria they're in the midst of the, the horrific civil war. The, in Israel, when we talk about the group that you're talking about, it's the Muslims. There's a question if the Muslims are declining or the Arabs overall. So one of the most interesting aspects that has to do with education in the Arab world in general is that just like the Haredi community, you saw that the women work and the men don't. And I said that in the Haredi education system, women study regular studies in high school because they're not allowed to study religious studies. That's the reason. But they, and then they work. In the Arab world in general, Arab Muslim world, the women are becoming more and more educated. As right now, by the way, they are three times more as educated than the men in the Arab community. This is having an enormous impact on their own society, and that's bringing the numbers of both childbirth down, they're getting married later, because they're going for an undergraduate degree and even a graduate degree. They're getting married later, and they're having less children in their own way. They're being, I mean, it's not, I'm not going to call it gentrified. It's, a, it's an issue of education. It's a direct result. That's true of certain segments of Arab citizens of Israel. It's not true of all of them. And that's just like in the Haredi community, okay? There are trends, but I can't yet say that they're an enormous change. I would say that we've probably reached the number where that 75% is going to be pretty steady. Um, it won't change dramatically. There are still segments within Arab population that have lots and lots of babies, like the Bedouin population, which has been very uh, in the news lately in Israel. 
Okay? You've been trying for a long time, please. Yeah, about uh, workforce participation. Uh, people who look at it think that uh, Arab and Haredi working mm -hmm. off the books affect these statistics very much or not at all? It's a very interesting question. So nice that I brought these graphs, right? Okay. Um, thank God they're graphs. The Arab citizens of Israel in the workforce do not represent the Israeli startup nation. When you dig down into the workforce of the Arab citizens of Israel, yes, they absolutely have doctors, lawyers, etc., but the bulk work in blue collar jobs. Okay? I'm clear, right? As I said before, the women are becoming much more educated than the men, and there's a transition which is happening on that level so that they, they have, they can study whatever they want in that sense. They don't get drafted. Many go to um, higher education, but in general, in the Arab education system, they do poorly on the examinations that get you into university. They find it much more challenging. Some of it is the language. So in the Arab sector, perhaps they're not declaring that much, but in general, it's part of a, they're generating a lower income. In the Haredi community, because their exemption from, in, from conscription, from being um, drafted into the military, is based on their saying that they are studying in yeshiva, if they go and declare that they're working, then that means that they're not exempt and they have to be drafted. Which means that within that, you actually have something built in which says I can't declare I'm working because if I declare I'm working, then I'm gonna have to be drafted. Israel right now is in the middle of a political issue which has to do it was more with the Haredi than with the Arab. The Arab issue came out too because of this, these, these different aspects that I'm bringing out of the changes in society, the fact that the Haredi are government funded and don't teach core studies and then they don't go and work and they're on social welfare. So that it was that question of the middle class supporting the people who aren't giving into society. All of it kind of came together and to a large degree Israel's elections in January 2013, almost a year ago, not for the first time in Israeli history, but in a, very, in a very obvious issue, the main issue in our elections was not about security, because usually it's to some degree about security, about the region. It was there, but the main issue was on the social implications, with the economic implications, with the education implications, with the workforce implications of these numbers. And who's supporting who in Israeli society? So I, I mean, I get in a roundabout way of response because we're in the middle of it. I want to add in one more thing, which is important on that. Um, the new party that was established this last year and then took such an enormous part in these Israeli elections and got 19 seats um, in the Israeli parliament, Yesh Atid, very much was focused on the economic issues of the middle class, kind of what you call secular Jewish, supporting the other groups in Israeli society and being the ones that serve in the military and the whole issue of the cost of living inside Israel. And look at what they did. They didn't take the Ministry of Defense, I mean in that sense that they had 19 seats. They took three main portfolios. And, and, and they are the kind of portfolios that you don't take unless you really want to change. They took the education portfolio, they took the um, finance portfolio and the health portfolio. Okay? These are not easy portfolios in Israel. And the education minister, who is modern orthodox, which puts him in that little subgroup of the subgroups, okay? the modern orthodox in Israel do work. They are drafted. Um, and so it's different than the Haredi community in Israel. And the education minister announced in August that Haredi schools have to put in the core curricula, what I said before that they don't teach, otherwise the education ministry won't fund them. Right? Okay? It's the end of the world as we know it. Don't worry, they didn't implement it. Because it was August. How can you bring out a declaration like that, education minister, and 24% of the kids who are gonna start first grade, what, you're gonna change now all of our education system? You gotta give us a year. 
So they deferred it by a year. And push comes to shove, I'm waiting to see what's going to happen next year in that sense. So that's just on one little aspect of how that impacts also in greater society. Please. תשאלי בעברית ואני אתרגם. So the question that was asked here is about the fact that in Israel there was a publication about the fact that there's less motivation of the 18 year olds not to be drafted in general but to go to the fighting units. And the question here is why is there that change and could it be because the seculars are the ones who are kind of like carrying everybody else on the back. So I don't actually think in the answer that it's about the 18 year olds. I think that it's about their parents. Okay? And when I say it's about the parents, the parents of the 18 year olds right now are in their 40s. Which means, okay, I mean, I'm already 50 some, okay? People in their 40s are the people who are already second, third, fourth generation, who are the ones who serve themselves in the IDF, who's perhaps their parents like fought in other wars. And it's that combination of what's happening inside the houses in Israel and how it's viewed overwhelmingly rather than the 18 year olds themselves. They have no problem in Israel to fill up the military units that need to be filled up. There's enough who do volunteer, but there are less volunteers than they had before. So again, it's, it's the combination of the above, and I'm also looking at the projection forward, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it up, and you'll excuse, it's like those doomsday kind of thing. But if we look at this one, okay? Because this is really disturbing. If Israel is a startup nation, which is based on innovation, education, that 46% before of what I showed you was being in the top of the OECD in education, which is our edge. That's what has given us our economic edge. These kind of numbers mean that within not our grandchildren, within 15 to 20 years, who's going to do it? Now, again, these are projections. It isn't deterministic. It isn't going to happen this way. I don't know. And the government in that sense is very aware of this. But there are trends here that are get the Haredi into the workforce, get the Haredi into the military. And you hear how divisive this is also in Israeli society. And I am going to end on a personal note. Um, I served for most of my adult life in the IDF. And the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, is a challenging environment for women. Now, most people think, ah, oh, Israel, the draft, we're the only country in the world where you have the draft for women. That's already exceptional. Women are drafted for two years. That's a very long time. Women get in and have for the last 20 years since it's changed into fighting units and into such a variety of capacities within the military. And yet, even now, after all of these years of change, there's still quite a gap between men and women in the Israeli military. When you bring in, and I say when, when you bring in the Haredi into the military, what balances out in society as being more important, less important? Women and equality within society as a right, which is such an obvious one? Or is it more important that Haredi men, who also have a right to not be alone in a room with a woman, because they're Haredi and that, they, they can't live that way. So what do you do? Do you change the IDF? Do you change all of the different um, um, capacities that women have advanced so much over the last 20 years in the IDF so you can draft the Haredi? Won't you be throwing the baby out with the bath? And these are challenges that we face right now because on every different one of the elements where you want to try and balance it out, there isn't an easy answer. I don't feel that in Israel, as a government, you can impose on portions of the society to be like you. You want to respect it. Isn't that also part of democracy? And yet, hand in hand right now, we have within our society enormous differences that start from the education system, through the draft, and afterwards into the economy. And it's 10.15. I really do feel that you guys are like, OK, I'll do a last round of questions, and then I definitely need to let you out. Please. Yes.
I can do it already now, because right now in this parliament, um, the Haredi parties have combined 18 out of 120 seats. That's both the Sephardic and Ashkenazi parties, okay? Because when I say Haredi, most people think only of Ashkenazi. In Israel, when I say Haredi, I mean both Ashkenazi and Sephardic. So both Shas and the other parties, Yadut I mean together, they have 18 out of 120. So that gives you one way of looking at it. Um, <clears throat> but lots of the traditional, religious traditional, but not religious, and will vote for Haredi parties. Again. <sighs> this graph says that they're going to be the state of Israel. Okay, and it's one of the questions which is on the table right now of what is the state of Israel because we have a tendency again to look at it kind of in the exodus eyes of 1948 and we're something else. And I'll end with hope. State of Israel today in 2013 has already evolved and changed in its society several times. In the 1950s we were different than we were in the 60s. In the 1960s, we were different from the 70s. And then in the 1990s, we had the enormous um, former Soviet Union Russian immigration. We change, we diverse. And so again, these kind of statistics that you're seeing up here, on the one hand, they need to be aware of them. They need to impact government choices in education, in how you evolve into the economy, to who you give social welfare, how you build a society. Society is a very challenging thing, and so I'm going to leave it. I know I put up here if I remember to. Okay? When we look at all of these different things together and add them up, and I'm leaving it as a question, not as an exclamation mark. Identity in Israel can be Israeli, and it can be Jewish, and it can be Western and Middle Eastern. Sometimes you think of yourself as the pioneer. Sometimes there's a start up as different people see themselves in different ways. Lots of people have combinations of identity that go between the different ones. But when we talk about Israeli generalities in general, when we look especially from the outside in, there's a gap looking at Israel, certainly from the UK, but really from any of the OECD countries or from any of the modern Western countries, because Israel is still militaristic, national, religious, Shoah-based, and pioneering, and none of the other countries that we kind of see ourselves as part of are the same. I'm not saying that this is good or bad. I'm just posing it right now as part of the challenges that we face as a society, that we face as a nation. And hey, the vinyana aratznik nachem. It's late. Go to sleep. It's the end of the day. Thank you. Okay.